O oh God, who gives us strength for each victory, with thanksgiving we come to worship you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we rise to sing our opening hymn, Rise Up, O Men of God. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O men of God, His kingdom there is Shall remain standing as we ask our brother Lennox Hyde to open our service in prayer. Lord, in the name of the Lord, we thank you for the privilege to come into your presence. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We ask for blessing now and what we've done this morning. Your word has been shared. The name of the songs. Lord, guide your servant as we give forth your word. Welcome. Welcome to Open Door Believers Chapel. Open Door Believers Chapel is a Plymouth Brethren Assembly. And last week our brother Fernando Williams reminded us that as an assembly, we are led by our the heads of our families, the men. And this morning, uh, we'll have a very special service as three young men share their testimonies. So I want to welcome you to yet another Family Bible Hour, or Believers Fellowship, I mean Community Worship Service. Announcements. On Wednesday, we'll have our Believers Fellowship that begins at 5.30, so right after work, we come and gather as God's people to fellowship with one another and to hear what the Lord would have to teach us. So that's on Wednesday, Believers Fellowship. On Friday, we have our Bible club that begins at 4.30, so all the kids come out on Friday, and then next week Sunday at the same time, 10.45, we'll have another community worship service just like this. At this time, we'll have an item by a male quartet. What's the name of the group again? Uh, Voices in Harmony. And uh, they'll be singing a song, I Will Follow You. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I move. I will follow. Serve. 
about the four fools I think one of his best messages in this series on head covering the four fools found in Proverbs chapter 1 the first fool was the simple fool this fool is deficient his sins uh, manifest itself because he is immature but the good thing about the simple fool is that he can be guided he can be counseled. He, recognize, he recognizes his folly. So elders, teachers, parents can mold the simple fool. The second fool defies. They laugh at sin. They mock at it. And uh, where the simple fool was immature, the second fool, immorality takes place in their lives. They find pleasure in practicing immorality. They willfully sin and turn their backs on wise counsel. So, they hate it when they counsel you. They reject counsel. So you have the, defi the deficient fool, the one who defies, and then the one who despises the third fool. Despises the glory of God's wisdom. They hate knowledge. They have no fear of God. They are strong-willed and believe in themselves and love to argue. And then of course there's a fourth fool who disbelieves. The fool says in his heart there is no God. This message really stood out to me because it, I started to reflect on my own life. And I ask myself, which one of those fools am I? Or do I have a mixture of these four? But not only that, you know, I'm in charge of a, a group of guys. And I realized that there are some persons you can mold and others you can't. You can't say anything to them. 
they will reject your counsel. And so one of the things that I've tried to do with my group, I pray and I say, Lord, I can't talk to them. You know, if I bring up certain things with them, they, they're not going to want to listen to me. But I want you to speak to them. And so I've given them a task. It's a four-step process. I've shared this before with you. I encourage them to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal themselves to themselves. Reveal their sin to themselves. So this morning, as we share... The first thing, we're going to do four things. One, each of us, including myself, we will open up and share something that is a problem that we have then. We're going to be confessing to you. The second thing that we'll do is read to you God's word that addressed this specific problem in our lives. As a group, we have been reading through Genesis and one of the most amazing things that happened last month as we met is that all three of us shared from the book of Genesis. So this morning, if I could title it, it would be Reflections from Genesis. Because all of us sharing from Genesis. What the Lord has spoken to us through Genesis. So one, we're going to open up our lives and share the thing that's, you know, our problem. We're going to simply read the passage that God spoke to us about. That's number two. Number three, we will share our reflections on that passage. And the last thing we'll do is encourage you. Whatever the Lord has encouraged us with, we want to encourage you with. So our hope is that as you listen to these three testimonies, that if you are struggling in any one of these areas, that God's word will speak to you. Not us. The word of God will speak to you. The other thing I'm hoping is that as you listen to these testimonies, you will reflect on your own life. What are the areas that the Lord needs to transform in your life? And hopefully, as you read God's word, he will speak to you as clearly as he spoke to us. So our first testimony will come from Richard Williams. Have you ever just lost your temper with someone and ended up regretting it? Has anger ever consumed you for a moment or longer? Well, not too long ago, one weekend, while I was doing some housework and yard work, my father and I got into an, a slight altercation. He said some things which I did not agree with, and this left me feeling angry. But much to my relief, he went for a drive. However, right after that, I got a call saying that he had just broken down on the road and that he needed me to bring him some stuff for the car. But he said not to bring the expensive stuff. So I jumped in my car with some bottles of water and bought some motor oil, but not the expensive ones. When I reached where my dad was on the road, he saw the oil bottles and he got upset that I had bought the really cheap oil. <laughs> I said that I thought you said to buy the cheap ones. He said, but that cheap? And I, and I asked, and he asked me to return the bottles. At this point, however, I had just about had it. And I said that that's a waste of my gas to take it all the way back to the Chinese shop, not knowing if they'll accept them back. So I instead drove to Brody's, which was closer, and out of spitefulness, got the most expensive oils and took them back to him. When I got back to where my father was, a shouting contest ensued between the two of us, and I just gave him the stuff through the window and drove off. I made some reckless statements to my father that day. I let anger consume me. While reading the book of Genesis, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, spoke to me from chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. And it reads, Now Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. 
In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. This is the word of the Lord. While reading through Genesis, a lot of questions came to my mind. However, when I reached this particular passage, the Holy Spirit reminded me of my fallen state and that the sin of Cain was crouching at my door. He reminded me that I had not exhibited self-control that day with my dad. Although what I, would say, what I said to him I would say in my words were just minimal things, what I felt inside of me in those moments was pure anger. Now I had no thought of murder in my heart, but looking back, that sense of relief that I felt when my father went away for the drive, it was almost as if he was dead to me in that moment. The Holy Spirit also reminded me through this passage that as a believer, I should be displaying the patience and self-control of one calling himself a Christian. My testimony, my living testimony to my father and to other unbelievers, well, for this day my father, was broken down that day. And it took many, many days or several weeks for things to finally normalize. So I'm learning in a practical way that it does not matter what my father may say to me or other non-believers may say to me, practicing non-believers, my response should be to show him respect and love for the sake of Christ's gospel. So what I am trying to do with the help of the Lord is to recognize that sin is ever present and is crouching and waiting to devour me. Sin is waiting for us to allow it to take us over, but we must learn to rule over it. So my encouragement to you this morning is this. You may have a problem with anger, and maybe you are wondering where to get help. Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, can provide you with the strength you need as you read his word. He will enable you to understand what it means to live a life for his name's sake. And in so doing, you can begin to overcome your anger. This is what is happening with me. Or you may not have a problem with anger, but have some other weakness. Genesis 4-7 tells us, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. But we are encouraged to rule over it. The verse says we must rule over it. The strength to rule over any sin in our life comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. His death on the cross enabled us to become dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Romans 6 says, We know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on his cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For when we die, we are set free from the power of sin. Since we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. But thanks be to God, for though at one time we were slaves to sin, you have obeyed with all your heart the truths found in the teaching you have received. You were set free from sin and became the slaves of righteousness. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, I'm thankful that you have sent your son to die for us on the cross. And, that, oh, and you have sent your son to die for the sin that wants to consume us. You have conquered it, Lord. And I pray that those who have never experienced your love and your grace, that they will come to a saving knowledge of your salvation, for there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. 
Lord, I pray that for those of us who are already believers, those who claim to be called by your name, that we will not be a hindrance or a stumbling block to those around us. May we display patience, gentleness, and self-control that you have given us through your Holy Spirit, instead of anger and malice of heart. Forgive us, Lord, and remind us of the new covenant that we have in Jesus Christ. In whose holy and precious name I pray, amen. amen. Worship team, thank you, Brother Richard, for opening your heart and life to us. Come, worship team. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Shall we rise? Time we have our second testimony by our brother Celestino Zolo. <laughs> Two incidents took place recently in my life that made me realize that I have a problem 
with being arrogant. And arrogant, by definition, means to be unpleasantly proud, behaving as if you are more important than or know more than other people. The first incident happened a few weeks ago while in Bible class. I corrected our teacher, Kirk, as he pronounced a word. And we went back and forth a bit until someone looked up the word and found how the word was pronounced. The way I went about correcting Kirk revealed my arrogance. Similarly, there was another incident at work where I made a suggestion about how we could improve a particular service. And the way I did it offended persons at my job. Our mentorship group have been reading through the Bible beginning from Genesis. And while reading through the book of Genesis, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, spoke to me from chapter 17, verses 1 to 14. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abram bowed down with his face touching the ground. And God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram but Abraham, because I am making you the ancestor of many nations. I will give you many descendants, and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in the future, and generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. I will give to you and to your descendants this land in which you are now a foreigner. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever. I will be their God. God said to Abraham, you also must agree to keep the covenant with me, both you and your descendants in future generation. You and your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male among you. From now on, you must circumcise every baby boy when he is eight days old, including slaves born in your homes and slaves bought from foreigners. This will show that there is a covenant between you and me. Each one must be circumcised, and this will be a physical sign to show that my covenant with you is everlasting. Any male who has not been circumcised will no, will no longer be considered one of my people because he has not kept the covenant with me. As I read this portion of Genesis, I was reminded that when I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, I became a part of God's covenant people who are circumcised, not outwardly, but who have been circumcised by the heart. As Romans 2 says, true circumcision is something that happens deep in your heart, not something done to your body. Such a person receives praise from God, not from human beings. The circumcised heart displays love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control, and so much more. In both situations, I presented the brutal truth in an unpleasantly proud manner without humility. I felt like because I knew what was being done wrong, it gave me the right to let others know that they are wrong. I did not display a circumcised heart. God made a covenant with Abraham. And the sign of the covenant showed outwardly that he and his descendants belonged to the Lord. Like Abraham, the sign of me being part of God's new covenant is a circumcised heart. A heart that will display his kindness, his love, his peace, his humility, his gentleness, and so much more. 
This morning, I want to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ, as I encourage myself, to live a circumcised life. We sometimes think we belong to Christ because we come to church each Sunday and Wednesday. Sometimes we think we sing well and praise the Lord that we are his children. But the true sign of a child of God is when we are transformed by his everlasting covenant, El Ola. The same word used here in verse 13 as Mr. Dickey has been teaching us on Wednesdays. This covenant was established when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Each month we are reminded of this as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Jesus himself said, this cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. 1 Corinthians 11:26. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For anyone who does not, does not know Jesus as Lord this morning, you can enter into this new covenant through Jesus Christ and receive a circumcised heart that will help you to live a pleasing life for his glory. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to you, knowing that we have small problems that can develop into big ones, Lord, may you continue to work in our lives and circumcise our hearts, because that is an everlasting covenant that you have made with the people who come to you and confess. Lord, this morning as we are here, may we continue to glorify you for who you are. El Olam. Amen. Thank you, Celestino. Change my heart, oh God.
Mental leader and elder Dwayne Scott. One of my problems as a child of God is my lack of faith in the words of God. I know and believe they can be trusted wholeheartedly. I know they will come to pass, but sometimes I wonder if my actions and my behavior reflect my faith in God's words. For example, Matthew says, oh you of little faith, do not worry about what you will wear or what you will eat. The pagans worry about those things. But put God's word first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. Over the past year or so, as a family, our monthly income has kind of decreased. And uh, for a number of reasons, and I've been finding it difficult to adjust. Over the past six months, I've been actually much better. But while reading the book of Genesis, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, spoke to me from chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. I know we read this over and over, but we're going to read it again. In the beginning, when God created the universe... The earth was formless and desolate. The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness and the spirit of God was moving over the water. Then God said, let there be light. And light appeared. God was pleased with what he saw. Then he separated the light from the darkness and he called he named the light day and the darkness night. Evening passed and morning came. That was the first day. Then God commanded, let there be a dome to divide the water and to keep it in two separate places. And it was done. 
So God made a dome and it was separated and it separated the water under it from the water above it. He named the dome sky. Evening passed and morning came. That was the second day. Then God said, let the water below the sky come together in one place so that the land will appear. And it was done. He named the land earth and the water which had come together, he named sea. And God was pleased with what he saw. Then God said, let the earth produce all kinds of plants, those that bear grain and those that bear fruit. And it was done. So the earth produced all kinds of plants and God was pleased with what he saw. Evening passed and morning came. That was the third day. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night and to show the time when days, years, religious festivals begin. They will shine in the sky to give light to the earth. And it was done. So God made the two larger lights, the sun to rule over the day and the moon to rule over the night. He also made the stars. He placed the lights in the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God was pleased with what he saw. Evening passed, morning came. That was the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters be filled with many kinds of beings, and let the air be filled with birds. So God created the great sea monsters, all kinds of creatures that live in the water, and all kinds of birds, and God was pleased with what he saw. He blessed them all and told the creatures that live in the water to reproduce and to fill the sea, and he told the birds to increase in number. Evening passed and morning came. That was the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce all kinds of animal life, domestic and wild, large and small, and it was done. So God made them all and he was pleased with what he saw. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them and said, have many children, so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting you in charge of the fish, the birds and all the wild animals. I have provided all kinds of grain and all kinds of fruit for you to eat. But for all the wild animals and all the birds, I've provided grass and leafy plants for food. And all this was done. God looked at everything he had made and he was very pleased. Evening passed, morning came. That was the sixth day. And so the whole universe was completed. While reading Genesis chapter 1 for the, I don't know, millionth time, the phrase, and God said, stood out to me. And I actually counted how many times it was said in this chapter. It's used 10 times. With his words, God brought into existence things that did not previously exist. The light, the sun, the moon, the land. With his words, he commanded and instructed the things that he brought into existence on how to work and to behave. He commanded the earth to sprout vegetation. He gave instructions to man and beast on what to eat. With his words, he blessed man and the animals, instructing them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And for the man, he commanded him to have dominion over every living thing in the sea and on earth. The Lord simply spoke and everything that he conceived in his mind came to be. When God spoke, 
things simply happened. A command was given and the emptiness of the universe obeyed. As I thought about this and I reflected on my own life, I asked myself two questions. If I believe that God through his words have power as described in Genesis chapter 1, why do I find it so hard to trust God's other words and promises? That just hit me like a ton of bricks. I am believing that God did this amazing thing, yet in other parts, I don't trust him. If I believe that God, through his words, had the power to create all this, why do I find it so difficult at times to obey God's other words and commands? As I thought about this, I realized the reason. The reason is that my fallen nature, our fallen nature, the fallen nature of the world that we live in, minimizes the authority, the validity, and the relevance of God's word to us today. We live in a world that is extremely critical of God's word. Many persons don't believe what we just read. So sometimes my actions reflect that I believe God's words. And other times my actions scream that I don't. Sometimes I hold fast to God's word for dear life. And other times I put it aside, not trusting that what it says can help me in my life's different circumstances. So this morning I want to encourage you in three ways. Number one, have a childlike faith in God's word. We just read it. I mean, we just sang it on you, the last song that we sang. I left the paper down there. This is something that has been hitting me like a ton of bricks. Recently, Mr. Sawatsky from Spanish Lookout, he, he explained to us that Moses put together the first five books and Moses taught this to the people of Israel right there at Mount Sinai. And recently, while reading through Genesis, I've been imagining myself as an Israelite listening to Moses. I don't know nothing, and I'm just listening to Moses and just taking it at face value. Have a childlike faith in God's word. God's word teaches us so many things. It teaches us who he is, how he created us, what he wants from us. And we live in a world, as I said before, that does not believe those things. So this morning, as my brothers and sisters in Christ, I encourage you, take God's word just as it is. God says, cast your cares on him, just believe it. Cast your cares on him. Secondly, as people of God, I want to encourage you to let your actions be consistent with your claimed beliefs. If you claim to believe God's word, make your actions line up with that. I never knew that that was the definition of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is not your actions not reflecting what you believe. And that was kind of like what was happening with me. I was saying, yes man, I believe the Lord, but practically in my life, I was worrying. And, uh, you know, as Uncle Dickie has been talking about, you know, the different kinds of women, I really thank the Lord for my wife. Because for some reason, I think it has something to do with her father, she just texts God at his word. She don't worry about nothing. And that has been rubbing off on me. And I thank God for her for that. Just take God at his word. So if the Lord says, he forgave you, believe it. He died to save you from sins. Believe that. Believe that. The Lord showed mercy to you. Believe it. And let your actions show that. You can receive God's forgiveness and not forgive. 
You can't receive God's mercy and not be merciful. You can't receive God's kindness and not be kind because that would be a hypocrite. Your actions would not be consistent with your claimed belief. Finally, not only have this childlike faith in what God says and ensure that your actions are consistent with what you believe, we say this over and over. Spend time reading God's word daily. Folks, you cannot develop your faith if you're not reading the word of God. You will not know what to believe unless you read the word of God. That is how faith comes, by reading his word. Let's pray. Father, forgive us. Forgive me for those moments where we lack faith in your words. Lord, your words are clear. You simply say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Help us as your people to spend time in your word. May we, may our actions, Lord, reflect what we believe. And Lord, if there's anyone here who has never trusted your words, this morning, Lord, may Jesus Christ and his love for them be made real in their life this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, the Bible in Romans 3 mm -hmm. it says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God every single one of us have sinned so we have our relationship with God is broken because of sin we cannot come to him in perfect peace for him to save us right but there is good news for us he said for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord sin deserved death sin deserved death meaning we deserve death but there is a free gift from our lord and savior jesus christ and in that free gift in romans 5 he said for, for in this, while we were still sinners, while we are still sinners now, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for you and me, for every single one of us, as we are in our wickedness, in our shame, in our pride, in our arrogance. Christ died for the ungodly. But there is even greater news. He said, for if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth is confessed and is saved. Friends, all you, all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord. The scripture says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. Now, think about it. You will get saved now if you call upon his name, the name of Jesus. There is no other name but his holy name. The name of Jesus. And then you can say, like the rest of us, it is well with my soul. You may be wondering if you're a visitor, why I can I can just call on a young man like this, or the young man share. Here we really place an emphasis on the word of God and training young men for leadership. When you're a visitor, you come here, you cause trouble. You call me pastor, I'm not the pastor. The Holy Spirit is the pastor of this church. Members know that. On that second note, I'm going to say this. When the night we were here, praying, and some people were sick, and nobody told us. Sister Kovenka is very sick. Very sick. Andrea Pereira, that is right behind the church. 
very sick. I'm going to ask you for one minute now. Just silently pray. Andrea Pereira, Sister Kofenka, Marne. People are sick, you know, and they're calling on the Lord. Let us pray. I abandon every distraction. My attention is set on you. My devotion, Jesus, my portion.
If I were to ask you, how has Jesus been transforming you? What would you say? This is a question that I ask persons all the time. How has been Jesus, how has Jesus been transforming you over the past week, over the past month, since the beginning of this year? What would your answer be? To be transformed by Jesus means to change from one state of mind or state of action to another. It means we're moving from a sinful way of thinking or acting into one of righteousness. How would you, what would you say to me? We just sang, oh victory in Jesus. Would you be able to explain to me your sinful state? Would you be able to tell me God's specific word to you? Would you be able to tell me how God's word impacted your life? And would you be able to describe your growth or your walk in victory? I actually wrote that before even knowing that we were going to sing that. So we sing, oh, victory in Jesus. But can you describe how Jesus has given you the victory? Is that something that you have been thinking about? Can you tell me that in specific detail? I'm realizing uh, over the past three years, as I've been working with these guys, discipling them, many times persons are unable to describe how Jesus gives them victory over different parts of their lives. Sometimes the number one problem is they are acting like fool number two and fool number three. They are not the simple fool who recognizes their sin. They are the defiant fool. They are the fool that despises God's word. So, we have a problem. We see it sometimes in our marriages, sometimes in individuals. You just can't reach them. So before God, before God's word can make an impact, they haven't humbly said, yes, I am a simple fool. So sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes persons do recognize they're wrong, but guess what? They're not spending no time in God's word. So the Lord has no place in their lives to make a change. I go show one person another boss and I call no name. As we were meeting for our group a few Saturdays ago, I got a call early Saturday morning. The person know who this is, right? I got a call early Saturday morning and the person said, Dwayne, I just start reading Genesis this morning. So we, we don't start one month before, you know. And the man called me Saturday morning and said, him just start reading Genesis. So he said, suppose I don't have nothing for share. I said to them, you will never have anything to share. Because for one whole month, you have not allowed God's word to marinate in your heart. God hasn't been speaking to you. So you can't rush and go read and say, okay, God tell me. No. The Lord speaks in his time. We don't know when. And so sometimes we see the problem that we have. But we want to find a scripture. Oh yes, this talk about it. And I tell the guys, do not find a passage. You spend time reading and let the Lord speak to you. And so these are some of the problems that I, I see sometimes as I relate to these guys. One, pride. A refusal to admit their sin. And number two, a lack of time in God's word. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to be the simple fool for the Lord. Open your lives and freely admit those areas in your life that needs changing and spend time in God's word. Don't rush it. 
our group we're going through genesis and we're taking our own sweet time let the lord in his time speak directly to you and guess what you will never forget those words that the lord gives you and then that will be your testimony you can say the lord is victorious in my life i was once like this immature his word broke forth in my life and this is who i am now this morning you may not know jesus so jesus can't transform you you need to know him and i know many times you hear this um phrase jesus is the answer yes jesus is the answer but guess what i can't tell you how jesus will be your answer folks when jesus works in your life through his word you will get his answer and then that will be your testimony that is something you can say lord man i can't believe it i was like this and now i meet you and you want to tell others you want to tell others so our prayer again is that as we have been sharing our testimonies what christ has been doing practically and specifically in our lives that you this week this month this year will open your lives to his word will spend time reading his word and get that specific word to you that will give you the victory that will transform you that will move you from one state of mind and action to the one that he wants for his glory. In his name we pray. Amen.